In this section, we're going to break up choice of therapy into two. And the first is basically to define what the therapies are, which we've done before, but let's do that as a quick review so that we'll know what we have available to us. The first is a simple ultrafiltration format. The ultrafiltration format is nothing more than running volume of blood through a filter. The filter will remove a certain amount of ultrafiltrate, and that ultrafiltrate will then either be uh, used for experimentation or generally just tossed down the drain. This removes blood, uh, removes water from the blood, or plasma water. It can be done as a slow, continuous ultrafiltration, which is usually a continuous format, or it can be done as an intermittent form of therapy, as intermittent ultrafiltration. If we now move on to dialysis, again, dialysis having the same thought process, blood flowing in, dialysate flowing in and out, this is standard intermittent hemodialysis, or if you do it in a VV, continuous veno-venous hemodialysis. If we were to take this now and say, well, let's not do dialysis, let's just do hemofiltration, what we would have then again is your system, blood flowing in, Again, just ultrafiltration, although the rates of ultrafiltration here are much higher, so now this becomes a much higher rate. And then a replacement either in a pre-mode or a post-mode. If this were done with intermittent, it would be intermittent hemofiltration. If it were done continuously, it would be continuous veno-veno hemofiltration, or CVVH. If, on the other hand, you wanted to add your dialysate and high rates of ultrafiltration so that you're now combining diffusion and convection, then that is called intermittent hemodiafiltration if done intermittently and continuous veno-veno hemodiafiltration if done as a continuous format. So those are the choices of therapy that you have. And so now how do you figure out who should get what form of therapy? Now let's go to severity scoring as a method of looking at who should or shouldn't be placed on dialytic support, since we already have now the methods for our choice. So one of the earlier ways of looking at it was the Apache system. And the Apache system, as well as the SAP system and the multi-organ system failure um, grading, were all ICU scores to tell you how sick someone was in the ICU. And then renal began with the Leano score out of Madrid, which is the first well-defined acute renal failure scoring system, and then developed straight through, through the French cooperative, through the Picard database score, which Meta put together, and the CCF score, which we had at our institution. And so what that does is it gives you the level of severity that the patient has entering into dialytic support. And then finally, should this dialysis be limited? Should we limit access to dialytic support if you have more than five organs failed? Or whether or not you have a hepatorenal situation with no possibility of, of a liver transplant? Or whether or not you have some other terminal disease and happen to have acute kidney injury on top of that? Should that restrict access to dialysis, dialysis support? And where there's a conundrum now is that there's a lot of research going on on these multi-organ failure patients that may in fact respond if dialysis is given earlier and not necessarily for renal support but for other organ support systems. So this whole idea of severity scoring, restricting access, etc., is all confounding a lot of the issues and may in fact create a lot of differences in indications for support of dialysis. Perhaps the better way of looking at it is to keep it organ specific. So what we'll do is perhaps follow one of the better known organ specific scoring, which is the rifle serial. The rifle system was defined in Italy by Claudio Ronco 
and associates in the ADKI group, ADQI group, in which they looked at creatinine as a method of looking at GFR and urine output as a method of looking at renal function. And they went down through the score of whether you're at risk, injury, failure, loss, or you're at end-stage kidney disease. And the issue here is that these various levels of renal dysfunction can in fact dictate what you might want to do. Do you start earlier? Do you wait for a later phase? Are there biomarkers that can tell you and lead you to an earlier diagnosis? These are all issues that have come up in acute kidney injury and are used and very influentially used in deciding when to start dialytic intervention. So with that being said, what we have is a standard method of looking at dialysis. When should you normally start dialysis? And this has been defined by uh, Ronaldo Bellomo and others, but this is probably the most distinct one. And if you look at it, oliguria is important, anuria, hyperkalemia. These are standard methods, severe acidemia, uremic encephalopathy, dysnatremias, drug overdoses with dialyzable drugs. These are all issues that are pretty well established as far as renal-related dialytic support. Now, if we move to are there specific things that should have a specific form of therapy, now we become a bit more sophisticated. For example, if you have brain edema, it's very important that you don't use intermittent therapy, that you use continuous therapy, because there are well-defined papers and well-defined studies that have shown that intermittent therapy tends to enhance brain edema, whereas continuous therapy either has no effect on brain edema, in other words, no worsening effect, or it may even help. So that's an area where continuous probably stands head and shoulders above intermittent. In hyperkalemia, for example, there is probably no real role for continuous therapy because intermittent therapy being much more efficient, much shorter, here you want efficiency and short time to control the high potassium. So at those two extremes, then you have other forms of therapy which may or may not dictate uh, what you are able to treat or other diagnoses or conditions that may or may not dictate what form of therapy you should use. If we then move into what is happening now in the field and what forms of therapy may in fact be used in what forms of, of disease entities or conditions, we're finding that fluid has risen to the top as one of the major issues in its contribution to mortality and morbidity. And so therefore fluid is becoming a major disease entity or condition that real may perhaps require more extracorporeal therapy. Congestive heart failure, acid-base disturbances, electrolyte disturbances. There is the use of extracorporeal therapy in sepsis either as adsorbers or removers of various substances. In ARDS, there's a whole movement in lung extracorporeal therapy support, whether or not that helps or doesn't help. So these are all things that are happening. And finally, in brain edema and in liver support. In fact, there are whole extracorporeal systems that are set up as adsorbers or removers for liver failure as a transient or bridge, perhaps, to transplant. So extracorporeal therapy and the indications for extracorporeal therapy, whether they be intermittent or continuous, whether they be convective or diffusive, needs to grow out of just its application to renal dysfunction and move into a whole patient analysis. If any of these other issues are involved, then perhaps extracorporeal therapy might be involved. So what we'll do now is move into specifics on when you might want to use intermittent 
and when you might want to use continuous. Thank you.